Our next presenter is Oberst Professor Doctor. Next presenter is uh, Colin Belozerov. He's heading the um, Institute of International Relations Social Policy at the Russian Linguistic University in Moscow. And uh, this is a quite a great combination because what we consider strategic thinking is one thing. If we have somebody for intelligence analysis, then we teach them two things, security policy thinking and languages. This is basic skills. And if at a university you start linguistics, languages, and political science at one university, um, but really combine them on the same level. It shows how the military thinking and has taken a different perspective on str strategy, uh, different from uh, Western Europe. Professor, may I ask you to uh, present your lecture? Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor uh, to be coming back here to give another lecture. And um, Vienna Strategy Conference is now taking place for the third time. When we look at what's happening in the world in this year, uh, we get the impression that the dynamics and the um, unpredictability of global and regional processes has really become stronger in the past two years. It is not simple to recognize the direction that these processes are taking, and it's not diff it's not easy to uh, make a forecast in order to diagnose some state of world politics and international relations. The strategic approach uh, already may result from the ideas of a wider perspective. I have used source data and instruments for better understanding, and they are at your disposal. It does make sense to use some methods such retrospective uh, forecast and analysis of the results of activities. Uh, however, for me as a Russian citizen, it is easier to uh, think about the retrospective and perspective of my country in connection with the geopolitical worldview. Uh, using uh, discretion and fragmentarity of, uh, I would like to give you examples and facts that may show, that may lead us to uh, determine important constants and determinants. It is a good idea to start with the thought of a known Russian Soviet military theorist, Alexander Svetshin. Quote, the entire content of strategy is a consideration of military history. Retrospective forecast means that you make a forecast of the future in dependence of the time frame looking at the history behind you. Now, this means if you want to make a forecast for five years, you have to look back into the past for no less than 15 years. If you want to make a forecast for the coming 10 years, then you have to know about the events of the past 30 years. And if you want to make a, a forecast for 15 years, then you have to understand the historical developments for no less than 45 years, and so on. In Russia, we sometimes forgot to learn from the past, and um, because uh, we did not, we did not remember in a way to make the conclusions necessary and to provide strategies. The um, governor heads of state of countries then um, actually 
um, made the wrong consequences based on the past and selected false alternatives for the future. In the meantime, in with the changes in the geopolitical worldview, we have seen uh, several influential global actors uh, they who see the existence of Russian as an error or a coincidence. In view of the fact that Russia does have a long history, it does make sense um, to look at a few cluster of events within the past century. First, it is a good idea to look at the uh, foreign interventions against the socialist Soviet Republic for be exactly 100 years ago. 14 states took part in this. An objective analysis shows that the aim of the parties intervening was not intervene, not fighting against the class and the enemy, the Bolsheviks, but to actually um, break up the territory of Russia and uh, to go for material enrichment. And this means that only allows only one consequence. Maintaining one country uh, was actually something they had not, the, any, the opponents of Russia hadn't really expected. Swetchin then said after the analysis of the role of Russia uh, in Entente that, quote, the Tsarist government actually made their contribution by being so subordinate and neglecting the interests of Russia. In the eyes of the Allied, uh, this actually denigrated Russia to a strategic Negro quote. Uh, this is switching. This is a direct quote by switching. After one year of the declaration of the 14 points by U.S. President Woodrow Wilson in January 1990, um, uh, all the existing governments um, in uh, um, actually um, um, uh, um, sorry, uh, I missed that. Um, we, you can imagine um, how many countries would have to be on the world map if uh, Russia had been broken up after the proposal, after the truce, when the uh, peace conference was called. Um, the uh, Bolsheviki. Um, uh, had to do, put up a lot of effort to keep one country. I would now actually remind you of the unbiased behavior of the anti-Hitler coalition allies with the USSR. After the victory, um, it reminds us of the destiny of Germany. In '94. the disarmament of the Wehrmacht was not really affected in all parts of the country. In the former English occupation zone, there were uh, there continued to be German armed forces with these troops. Military training was done. The German soldiers and officers were wearing the insignia and orders of the Third Reich. Only alone in Schleswig-Holstein, there was about a million of German soldiers and officers that were not treated as um, war prisoners of war. I would like to remind you that a speech in summer 1945 uh, is the source of this. It is a good idea to draw the attention on the book of Mikhail Gorbachev and his uh, political romanticism. Um, political romanticism means that you deny reality, that you the um, 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 that you have a lack of objectivity, that you refuse to understand the actual source of political. Um, for this romanticism, any practical political work is uh, not the right way to go, go because you, uh, quote, faith and love should not be wasted in the political word. 
At the end of the 80s of the last century, the uh, proponents of an honest and open foreign policy, Michael Gorbachev, felt it right that these values uh, divided by East and West um, were important to pursue general human interests. It is now a considered a feature of political romanticism, both in the claims and actions of the Soviet leadership of that time, and it's important to say the following. The uh, refusing the war as a means of policy, the unilateral disarmament of the Soviet Union, uh, the announcement of the incredibly important role of the political dialogue and force, the, uh, the statement of the Soviet Union to go for an open and honest policy. The practical implementation of such a statement meant actually uh, for in the, uh, uh, that uh, that uh, independence of global policy was turned down, the national interests, and together with the misunderstanding of the geopolitical logic of the historical process, the political non-professionalism, those were the causes of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, its disappearance had many consequences, including the, the, the consequences uh, that were a threat for international security. In the book published in 1999, Preventive Defense, the uh, U.S. Defense Ministers William J. Perry, former Defense Minister, and Ashton B. Carter describe the possible emergence uh, of the Ukraine among the nuclear powers uh, with uh, with almost 2,000 uh, nuclear charges after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, in in, in um, the U.S. Deputy Foreign Minister Rose Gottemuller called the Ukraine a decision on the, uh, den uh, the refusing to go for nuclear weapons in the 90s as heroic. In Russian politics, including Tsarist, Soviet, and post-Soviet periods, together with Gorbachev's time of the new thinking, there are many other examples of political romanticism and naivete uh, that actually uh, have had effects on foreign security and defense policy. We could mention the following. The first, number one, the implementation by the use of military force and the uh, use of messianic ideas to save Euros and its ruling dynasties, the containment of revolutionary uh, movements um, by, promoted by these governments, the acceptance of Russia to um, uh, obligation uh, in within the framework of war coalitions. Uh, the partners of Russia oriented their actions according to, to purely pragmatic considerations. The um, inconsistent in the selection of allies and partners, the unjust use of resources in the military and uh, their support and help. The striving, in some cases, without a true necessity to achieve the final military and political defeat of the opponent. Last, in the end, these attitudes and actions led to the implementation of to realizing of others' interests in Russia. Russia was left in the wake of foreign policy um, in, in the, caught in the ability to um, uh, draw advantages within the framework of the military and uh, the and its depend, independence was limited. Um, on the other side, a pole of romanticism and naivete or pragmatism and the enforcing of national interests. In a more radical version, in this case, the necessities are publicly stated and uh, argued. 
um, to, de to um, uh, harm the partner and the rest of the world. For example, the Americans uh, for a re a researcher Samuel Huntington in his known book, Clash of Civilization, refers to the conflictability of the West compared to all others and explains thus the status quo that has arisen. In his opinion, um, the West, and especially the U.S., that has always been a nation with a sense of missions, are convinced that non-Western people actually should decide for Western values, democracy, free markets, controlled government, human rights, individualism, and rule of law, and that these values uh, should be included in their institutions. Um, Huntington claims that regarding international reforms on hypocrisy, double standards, and then but not are the price for universalistic um, um, hy um, hypocrisy. The questions that the West and other societies uh, that divide the West and other societies are becoming increasingly important. Three of these actually concern the efforts of the West. Number one, the politics of non-proliferation and prevention. Um, second, the uh, the political values and institutions uh, by non-Western countries should be uh, demanded. And three, the number of non-Westerns who are migrating as refugees into the West should be limited uh, to protect cultural, social, and ethnic integrity of Western societies. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it we are talking about the consistent limitation and development of isolate and isolation of non-Western nation. The means and methods are known. Uh, for example, the uh, expansion and the uh, approach divide and conquer, bloody and destroying events of penetration into the Anglo-Saxon democratic models in uh, a societal life of the non-Western world are well known to today. However, the, uh, there is the more blatant difference to hunting and in, to be found in the statements of the well-known American political scientist Walter R. Mead. Uh, his book was written in the mid in the first decade of the 2000s, and it was published in Moscow and Russia with the support of the U.S. Embassy. What is um, interesting here, and this is a few quotes from by the author, the mission of the U.S. consists that uh, to help the foreigners to understand their own prosperity better. The Americans have always believed that both are religious, else also their political values should prevail in all over the world. And third, from time to time, ungrateful neighbors have refused the power monopoly of the U.S., but this did not shake the deci decision of our country to solve military problems in our manner. In any case, we were decided to decide ourselves what we consider as our home." End of quote. In my opinion, um, uh, with our partner, we have to thank our partners for being so honest. It makes sense that Europe and the West are uh, characterized by a um, um, trend uh, to see the rest of the world as an object of their civilization. But the civilization in the form of colonialism and stopping the development of other peoples is a, a thing of the past. In addition, we, we um, the possibilities and resources are getting fewer and fewer. It is enough to say that the United States of America uh, presently generate 18 to 20 percent of the worldwide GDP. Um, the the percentage was 50 percent some time ago, and immediately after World War One, it was still higher. 
If the national defense strategy of the U.S. in 2018 um, is based on the thesis of long-term strategic competition with Russia and China, uh, this means above all that the world has is returning to a global confrontation of the West with other civilization and cultures. Unhappy Somali pirates have been forgotten, and terrorists are only pawns in a large game that they don't know anything about. And then, now I would like to ask a question. Can the world exist without Russia? Um, for some years now, the modern Russia has been living under the conditions of economic sanctions. The official statements by uh, the leaders are known uh, as regards sanctions. Sanctions are an illegal, violent, and unsuccessful uh, means to put pressure on Russia. The irrationality of this means is something that is understood by many in the West and Europe. But let's try to observe, look at sanctions with its causes and consequences in, in a different way. Um, academics and polit academic and politician Jürgen Primakov uh, stated not long long before he died in 2017 his conviction that the um, anti-Russian sanctions would have been uh, imposed independent of the uh, emergence of the crisis situation in the Ukraine and Syria. Why? Because Rus Russia was beginning to understand its own national interests and values, and now Russia is standing up for its interests and wants to be accepted, demands to be accepted as a player. And such an emergence is still uncommon for many people in the world. In Russia itself, the population uh, consider pressure from the outside by m sanctions and other means, not as a treasure against Putin personally or the government and other personalities, but they see this as actions against their country and the people in general. Thus, these are the features of the historian understanding and awareness of Russian citizens uh, that are uh, not, very often not drawn by, uh, for undetermined reason, in the West. As a result, there is a reverse effect. The political consolidation is happening uh, in order to. Uh, uh, this means that the results of the um, uh, presidential elections, uh, this can explain the results of the presidential elections that took place in March 2018. The uh, mentality differences between Russia and the West has been confirmed by the um, different interpretation of freedoms. In Russia, the freedom is not the lack of an arbitrariness of power, but the um, missing of the uh, conquer, uh, but as the lack or non existence of a conqueror. The, this uh, different interpretation of the meaning of freedom is the result of the historical development of the country and of the power play. Understanding of not understanding this fact was shown by uh, the Swedish king Charles XII, Napoleon, and Hitler. They um, actually tried to liberate the Russian and Russian people from the Tsar, from feudalism, from Stalin, the communists, and the, uh, all forms of despotism. The pressure on Russia and the modern conditions is actually something that is perceived by the public as uh, the next attempt to divide the country or to destroy it. The history has shown that the problem of the um, uh, one country for Russia was always a topic. 
despite the permanent presence of uh, current of uh, current social contradictions and feudal spli splintering, uh, the Russian society is based on a strong idea of the protection of their idea of protecting their soil and of being one country. This protection was considered an important precondition for prosperity and the survival of the country. Now, in the 12th century, there was this uh, song of Eiger's expedition. And that's an unknown author, of course, and he perceived Rus as a unified country, and he actually mourned the end of the feuds. Let's combine the irresponsible and selfish behavior of the princes in terms of military defeats suffered by them. Therefore, the people of Russia always expected the political leaders and elite to create the conditions for security and public welfare and reliable protection of the homeland. The aforementioned old Russian work contains a direct accusation leveled against the princes that, uh, well, this is a reference to their responsibility before the homeland and the consequences of their disputes. The danger and the probability of Russia's fragmentation has long been no secret to many researchers and politicians, including its opponents. And it is well known that Clausewitz also came to this uh, conclusion. Such a country can only be conquered by its own weakness and by the effects of inner conflict. In order to get over these weak points of political existence, I believe uh, requires a, a special mention. It seems that the uh, academic Yevgeny Primakov correctly understood these dangerous tendencies of uh, the developments in international relations. In his book that was published in 2009 and that has the title The World Without Russia and the subtitle was Where Does This Political Short-Sightedness Lead Us? And then the geopolitical conflict intensified and there were clear bifurcation points, uh, the crisis in Ukraine and Syria. And as a consequence, the next crusade started against Russia. That was started by President Obama in 2015 in the U.S. security strategy. So Obama wrote the following. We mobilized and led international efforts to punish Russia and to counteract its aggression. So he thought that uh, Russia's economy would be in tatters. And Russia came, uh, well, in contact with such death threats to the whole world as the terrorist Islamic State and the Ebola virus. And in fact, Nobel Peace Prize winner Obama denied Russia the right to exist. Now, can Russia accept such a fate? This is most doubtful. It is only recently, namely in March of 2018, that Vladimir Putin said quite emotionally, so why do we need such a world in which Russia is missing? And indeed, this uh, rapprochement uh, and the red line after the collapse of the Soviet Union was only logical. So I think we need to turn to statistics which reflect the development of some post-Soviet states. No. Some changes that uh, took place since then are quite depressing. For example, the changes in terms of the de demographic development are very characteristic. I have only included countries such as Ukraine, Moldavia, 
Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. So it is pointless to deny that post-Soviet states made their own choices and identified their development direction. Well, they say, cuius religio, eius religio. If it's your country, you determine the religion. So the above states are actually moving in the direction of, uh, well, becoming extinct. And in this respect, the question arises as to whether the political course pursued by these states, which, which is often accompanied by anti-Russian rhetoric, corresponds to national interests and the conservation of its existence. If that isn't the case, then whose interests uh, are pursued by implementing those policies and strategies? Mind you, I would like to draw the attention of those present here to a complicated theoretical problem. It is about the connection and the interdependence of the fulfillment of national interests on the existing political regime. So this is done at the same time as the aforementioned processes, NATO's eastward expansion and reaching Russia's borders and the development of the campaign on Russia's aggressiveness. So in the language of uh, the art of war, such actions should be classified as acts of war, stratagems, operational strategic camouflage and deception. It is fitting to mention that this uh, humorous newspaper, Berliner Krakela, in its issue dated on the 22nd of June 1848, came out with a huge headline, the Russians are coming. And a hundred years later, the first uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, fell out the window. And during his illness, he repeated uh, the day before, the Russians are coming, I've seen Russian soldiers. And similar phobias are still present today. And modern geopolitical struggle and fighting, numerous methods, forms, technologies and procedures are used. For example, changing of the value system, provocations, staging, for example, of a poisoning as a sacrificial death and the formation of international institutions, limiting national sovereignty. Walter Russell Mead called it, called these institutions tough or glutinous powers. And the development and training of the anti-Russian elite, regime change, and the manner of colorful revolutions, or the recognition of a quorum or legitimacy of political subjects according to their own interests, or the refusal of such recognition, and the construction of trouble spots near Russia and Europe. Today, there is a tendency to reject the established rules in international relations and to expand areas of conflict. For example, the politicization of international sport. There's now a turning away from the concept of the cherished war, of international war. So, in today's global combat space, there is unrestricted combat. So, there are non-state armies that take place and are involved, rather than numerous troops of the political infantry. Uh, among the latter, you can count multinational corporations or military service providers or pseudo-human rights organizations or pseudo-religious organizations, mainly unconventional denominations, destructive opposition, mass media, in particular global media groups, radical, nationalist and extremist organizations, and so on. Ukraine well, had a very delicate conflict and uh, was permanently exposed to slander. Well, in Russian, we say it's like an open wound. So I would like to emphasize in particular that 
something that the Russian society and the professional public are perceiving what is happening as a tragedy and as a national disaster, sometimes even as a personal disaster. So in this regard, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov recently called the actions of the West during the crisis in Ukraine in 2013 and 2014 as treason in relation to international law. The objective analysis of the situation shows that violent and illegal change of power in Ukraine in 2014 was an ingenious geopolitical operation. It uh, didn't require solid financial investments. Uh, to understand this fact, one has to answer two simple questions. The first question is, who created those problems? Obviously, Ukraine itself, Europe and Russia. The second question, who benefits from it? Well, there are those who created those problems for Ukraine, Europe and Russia and as a result of yet another additional means of pressure, uh, the states uh, that were affected by it. So these thoughts also allow us to see an additional outcome of this policy. Objectively, it's a strategic and geopolitical apron that is created between Russia and Europe. Now, under those conditions, we have to try to answer the question, what Russia does Europe need? And does Europe need Russia at all? There are various answers, even radical ones. The Russian philosopher Ivan Ilyin in the 1930s, when he was in exile, wrote the following about this. Europeans need an unseemly Russia, a barbaric one, to civilize it in their own way. It needs to be threatening within its latitudes to separate it. It needs to be aggressive to form a coalition against it. It needs to be reactionary to justify a revolution in it and to demand the establishment of a republic in return. It needs to be religiously decayed to push into it with a propaganda of reformation of Catholicism and economically incapable of acting to claim its unused space, its raw materials, or at least favorable trade negotiations and concessions. But if this rotten Russia can be used strategically, then Europeans are prepared to form alliances with it and to demand from it military efforts to the last drop of its blood. Fortunately, at present, there are no characteristics of the revival of uh, this mutually beneficial cooperation between Russia and Europe are emerging. So this testifies to the victory of reason and liberation from propaganda cliches. Now the following facts are convincing enough. In 2016, German companies invested 1.95 billion euros in Russia in spite of sanctions, which is 170 million euros more than in 2015. Now, Russian investments in Germany increased from 2.6 billion euros in 2011 by 3.46 billion euros in 2015. The trade turnover between Russia and Austria in 2017 alone increased by more than 50 uh, by more than 40 percent and amounts to more than four billion dollars. Now the following numbers are also characteristic. In 2016, the goods turnover between Russia and Iran increased by 70 percent compared to 2015 and currently amounts to more than 2.18 billion dollars. And another statistics. In the first four months of 2018, Ukraine increased the imports of Russian goods by 31 percent. And the volume of imports amounts to 2.6 billion dollars. Now these 
strange relationships uh, form between the victim and the aggressor. So in conclusion, the following should be noted. Global conflicts do not disappear from international relations. So this outcome is impossible. International relations remain in the natural state of constant struggle. The actors in this global political process must resolve the issues of mutual recognition and the rules of the game sooner or later. Ladies and gentlemen, in my presentation there are many open and well-known facts and also a number of rhetorical questions were introduced. So maybe those present here and other researchers can draw their own conclusions from this combination. And finally, I think it is helpful to mention a well-known wisdom. Nothing new happens under the sun. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, dear Professor Dr. Belozerov, for this presentation, the return of geopolitics, power politics actually, into the arena of international relations and the presentation of this point of view from the perspective of Russia. So Russian thinkers uh, from the past were introduced and also their world view, the world of geopolitics seen from a different perspective, namely from the Russian perspective. So this academic debate of course depends and thrives on hearing about different points of view, theory and practice and different points of view determined by geopolitics. The subject of the conference has been subject to an academic uh, questioning of the motivations from the perspective of Russia. So thank you for that. We'll now have a round of Q&A. And we will start with, yes, a gentleman in the back, and please bring a microphone to the gentleman. I have two questions for Professor Belozerov. So the question is, are the right of people to self-determination, self-determination in the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula? To what extent do you defend that annexation? And we're talking about use Kogans, so cogent law. And the second question isn't a legal but a political question, namely the role of George Soros and his NGOs in Ukraine. How do you assess their role in Ukraine? Thank you. And thank you for this interesting presentation. Yes, thank you for your question. Well, you know, the situation in the Crimean is, well, quite diverse and multi-layered. In this process, this annexation to Russia, well, there are various dimensions in this respect. There are some political dimensions, some strategic ones, also military strategic dimensions, etc. So I believe that it is a very complicated issue and the answer would require a lot of time and it would have to be detailed. So if you want to be more concrete or specific, then I can of course relate to that. 
Physisch ist hier, sondern äh, mir geht es nur darum, ob sie grundsätzlich der Meinung Okay, what I'd like to know is whether you fundamentally believe that uh, what happened there is an act of self-determination. Well, in Russia, we believe that the solution helped to protect and ensure the rights of the inhabitants of Crimea. But that is just one side of the problem, and there are many different aspects. I can show up some profound root causes, but I will try to answer your question by answering your second question. So from my personal point of view, I can tell you that Ukraine, pro-Soviet Ukraine, after it was created, it had to address the question of the unity of the country. So all Ukrainian governments were dealing with other questions. And what happened in 2014, Russia was simply forced to intervene. We want to have a safe, secure and peaceful neighbor. I have a lot of friends and relatives in Ukraine, like many other Russians do as well. So we have a lot of contacts and that's my personal, maybe subjective assessment that the Ukrainian government today is ethnocratic and nationalist and is building up an ethnocratic and nationalist state. That's the main problem. Since 1991 or 92, they have, uh, well, they, they should have turned these individual components and parts of the country into a unified country. Well, you know, when it comes to tactical questions, methods, and the concrete facts in terms of what Soros is doing in Ukraine, I'm unfortunately not able to enlighten you. Okay, thank you. Next question. Well, allow me not to ask a question, but to make a comment on your interesting and very enlightening presentation. You talked about the subject or the overarching subject of this seminar, and you, you hit the right nerve because it's about a question of the narrative. And this is why it isn't possible to discuss individual points. But your narrative, and that is worrying, is the narrative of, well, the elegy of somebody who was kicked and beaten. And this narrative does not correspond to your own history, nor to your position, nor to your self-image. And I think it is, ex it is explicitly dangerous to have such a narrative which uh, turns oneself into a victim and uh, indicts others uh, to enter like that into a political debate, because such a debate can only end negatively. Well, I'd like to answer that. You know that this isn't the first time in this room that I'm hearing that Russia is a dying country, that Russia has plans uh, to conquer whatever, so and so on and so forth. So. The purpose and the end of my presentation was to talk about uh, the root causes of Russian strategies, at least in part, how our strategy is structured. Of course, that is a very difficult matter that requires a lot of deliberations and 
requires special efforts to be undertaken. And Professor Belozorov cannot do it on his own, of course. He's not empowered to do that. Okay, last question, please. Helmut Malnik. I would like to state on a general note that everything has at least two sides. Every argument has at least two sides. You talked about apron, or I call it a glacis. So one side has won an apron or a glacis, and the other side, well, at, at the expense of the other side, of course. So the only thing that I didn't quite like about this is that certain parallels are established with respect to the uh, Sudetenland in terms of the legal situation. Well, I can try to answer your comment. Apparently, uh, my answer will not be complete and comprehensive, of course. We can compare the situation and the facts as they stand, well, let's say, between 1998, uh, 1989 and today. So we can compare the situation of Russia, or the former Soviet Union, the former Soviet republics, and the Eastern European countries. And from my perspective, the most important and global task of all governments is to provide their countries with security and prosperity. If people don't want to give birth to any children or if they leave their country, this means that something is going awry. We have to live on this planet. And to me, and well, there's also an interesting example, the strategy pursued by China. China has, has declared the following quite openly. Well, the Chinese leadership, at least, have declared the following quite openly. So this is the task for the coming two centuries. So the task of the coming two centuries is to build up a highly developed socialist civilization. And do Russia and the European nations also pursue such an ambitious task? That's another matter. So all people present have to believe me that I also have a lot of questions in terms of my government and its policies. So I'm not trying to show here that uh, I and everybody else uh, are backing Putin in every single respect. And in terms of every issue, but I have to, well, think about the future of my country, my children, for my currently only grandchild, so thank you very much, Professor Dr. Bilozerov, for your presentation on the return of geopolitics, power politics into international relations, and especially for presenting the Russian perspective. As is customary, I would like to also hand over our Strategos wine, a red wine, and thank you for participating in our conference.
darf mit dem Dank anschließend Herrn Professor für den hervorragenden Vortrag danken. Thank you, Professor, for this excellent presentation. I would also like to tell you that the Professor is the only Russian speaker in our event, and therefore his position is already a bit hard, and the presentation, from my point of view, has been very instructive and very honest. This, of course, means that there are some controversial issues that are raised, and that has nothing to do with an antagonistic or offensive attitude. This honest way of speaking out allows him to take a, a controversial position. That's the basis of a discourse. That's why we're here, and I think that that helps us move forward. One second. In particular, and I have to take the time to mention this, uh, the reference to Clausewitz really helped me, the strategic reference that you made. I believe that in the German-speaking countries, and I think General Militat will agree with me, the general staffs are trying to retreat to the operative level, and the strategic dimension and the spiritual dimension that Clausewitz admonishes us not to forget was not fully implemented, to put it cautiously. So Clausewitz, in the case of an attack on Russia, endeavor Barbarossa, was well, said in a threefold way not to do it. He gave the example of Napoleon, and he showed clearly that if you march on Moscow in winter, well, then uh, the population will suffer, but still you're not going to get anywhere, strategically speaking. And he started with uh, this uh, main thrust towards Chauvigny, and he then extended this to four or five other uh, ends that were all not received. And as far as such offensive campaigns are concerned, he uh, said that we shouldn't think in terms of capitals. And he explicitly, after having analyzed uh, the Battle of Hannibal, where he won operatively but not strategically, to extend tactics to the strategic level because these thrusts, these gaps, well, the battleground simply is not clear enough and this doesn't allow for such analogies to be drawn. So all of these three admonitions were, were forgotten. The general staff uh, uh, told Hitler to proceed, and uh, Hitler launched the endeavor Barbarossa as a super cane that was based on two pillars. And the final piece, the crown and glory, came with Moscow. So against all warnings of Clausewitz, this is really unstrategic action. And Clausewitz, of course, uh, well, referred to this Explicitly, I think uh, this should be a warning to us all. Thank you very much, dear Professor. I think we can take a 10-minute break. So please be back at uh, well, in 10 minutes time, so at 18.17. Uh, uh, Thank you. Well,